Uh, that's a uh, lot of peas. <laughs> Let's pray it doesn't paint us as a pair of problematic pariahs. All right. So, Kriya, would you like to go ahead and introduce us? And with that, allow me to welcome you to episode six of a podcast where today we will be eschewing the rules of polite company and talking about, you guessed it, politics and games. But before we go down that rabbit hole, Adam, would you like to fill us in on what you've been playing this week? All right. Well, uh, I have, I'm going to cheat again. I have not had a lot of time to play this week. As you might have noticed, I have some things here in my face. Had to go into a, for a biopsy. Uh, also, my wife is uh, on vacation this week, which means she's at home and occupying the TV. Uh, so I'm going to kind of go back a little bit into the past. And not too recently, but earlier this year, I was playing Final Fantasy VII Remake. So I'm going to be reviewing that. Uh, so as you know, obviously the game is going to be Final Fantasy VII Remake. All right, this is created by Square Enix. And this is a reimagining, but also a updated graphic. 7. So this was released on March 20. It was supposed to come out a little bit earlier than that, but then... The sewer rats uh, appear to call later. themselves Avalanche uh, Surf. So, you can have it for saving my life. You think he's a keeper? <laughs> Y'all gotta look at the bigger picture here. Nothing worth fighting for was ever won without sacrifice. Help me! <laughs> Obviously. Uh, this being in parts, it's not one complete Final Fantasy VII like the original. They're doing this in parts. So they do have to kind of introduce certain characters a little bit earlier to kind of give you that hook because otherwise you might have this character popping in in Section 3, which, you know, new players might be like, who's this guy? Why do I care? Uh, whereas people from the original game would have known that because that was their natural introduction. Uh, but gameplay wise, they've changed quite a bit. So the old school Final Fantasies were what they called ATB or active time battle. And what that basically meant was it was a variation of turn based where traditional turn based is I take a turn, you take a turn, I take a turn, you take a turn, similar to tabletop games like D&D and that sort of thing. Well, what active time battle does is you basically just have a little bar that will charge up. And that's based on your character's speed stat. And when that bar is full, then your character can take an action. So faster characters are acting more often. Slower characters are uh, acting less often. And of course, you can augment that with spells like haste or slow. Now, uh, now the game has gone more into an action kind of game. So everything's in real time. You attack in real time and all that. But obviously, fans of the original game were very, very adamant that they really wanted active time battle, especially the old school uh, fans, okay? Now, they wanted to bring it into the modern era, but they also wanted to kind of appease those old fans. So what they've done is they've created kind of this hybrid action active time battle system. And what happens is, is basically your character can auto attack at any time, as a, just like you would in, say, Legend of Zelda or Devil May Cry, uh, so you're always doing your auto attacks. And what those will do is charge up your active time battle bar. It'll it'll naturally charge slowly. But every time you attack an enemy, it'll give it kind of a little boost. And then when that's full, then you can use all your extra abilities. So that's when you can use an item. You can cast a spell. Or now characters have a lot of uh, unique abilities to them that really separate the way they play. So you can activate those abilities as well. Um, there are some plot changes. Like I said, they do add in some characters a little bit earlier than you might normally see them. Uh, I wasn't a huge fan of that, being a huge Final Fantasy VII fan. I would have preferred that they had stuck with the original uh, story. But then at the same time, I get it. You know, They want to bring in that new market, not just appeal to the nostalgia. Um, but what I do like is that they do expand some of the minor characters quite a bit. Uh, and the original game, you have three characters that help you out, Biggs, Wedge, and Jesse, and they're just kind of there for a while, and and then, you know, they're gone. 
But here they kind of expand them out. So we get a little bit of background on them. We know what their hobbies are. We meet their one of we meet one of their families. Um, so they do kind of expand a lot of these minor characters quite a bit. Uh, moving forward, it's kind of up in the air. The way they ended it was they pretty much followed the Midgar plot, but then they've kind of left it open as to one of the key themes of this is destiny versus choice. And Destiny representing the original arc of the original game. Do we follow Destiny? Do we follow the way things are intended to go? Do we follow the original beat of the game versus choice? Do we Are we able to do things differently? And so it'd be interesting to see how they go with that. Are these characters really going to follow their Destiny and the original canon storyline? Or are they going to follow their choices and kind of branch out and do something different from what they originally did. So it will be interesting to see where they go with that moving forward. Uh, if I were to recommend this to somebody, I would recommend it to somebody who's a fan of the action RPG kind of genre. Uh, it's not going to be as intensive as, say, something like Nier Automata or Bayonetta or Devil May Cry, uh, but it does add a unique flavor with this uh, active time battle RPG kind of element. Uh, I would also highly recommend it for nostalgic Fun of us, E7 fans. Although, do be cautious and temper your expectations because they do change a few things um, that might make some people kind of irritated. Uh, and then also, like I said, going forward, it looks like they might not necessarily do all the same things. So it is something to kind of watch out for if you're one of those hardcore, like, canon, canon, canon kind of people. Um, I would also recommend this for younger people. Obviously, Final Fantasy VII is a huge influential game. It, it's kind of, Final, I would say Final Fantasy VII is to RPGs what Halo is to first-person shooters in that RPGs were kind of niche. And then with Final Fantasy VII, they kind of ballooned out and became this huge thing and kind of became the kind of a, a main market kind of genre. In the same sense that first-person shooters were kind of a PC niche thing. And then when Halo came out, suddenly, wait, we can have shooters on consoles? I mean, you know, we had them with like GoldenEye, but Halo was really the one that brought that out. So uh, for younger people who've heard of this game but never really played it, and it has not aged well graphically, so I can see, I know a lot of younger people are looking at it and they're like, oh my God, how did you ever survive this? What is that square? Um, then I would definitely recommend that they use this as kind of an entry level thing, so... So I'm going to open the floor for questions because I know Korean usually has some. I always do. Um, <laughs> thinking about this, because uh, when Final Fantasy VII, the original came out, I watched my roommate play it uh, back when I was living in Massachusetts. Um, comparing the remake to the original uh, in the Adam Gray scale, you know, 10 being great, 0 being terrible, what would you give the remake compared to the original? Ah, uh, see, it's so hard to gauge that because in a way, I almost feel like they're not even really that comparable. The Final Fantasy VII was definitely a product of its time. Uh, and that's why if you look back graphically, I mean, the characters have these weird Popeye arms and, and this is graphically beautiful. Back then, it was not graphically beautiful. It, it was, even, even by back then standards, it was kind of goofy looking. Um, and it has not aged as well as some of like the, even like Final Fantasy VI, which is sprite based and 2D has aged better. Than Final Fantasy VII, which was fully 3D. Um, as far as gameplay, I at first wasn't really into the action RPG thing because it was very different than what I wanted, but it did kind of grow on me. Uh, but as far as comparing them, I would say I would say look at this as kind of an example of. The Terminator movies where they all kind of are part of the same universe, but each one doesn't necessarily have to associate with the other one because of weird time loops and things like that. So I would say kind of look at it that way. They're both part of the Final Fantasy VII compilation, but I would look at them as two distinct different games. I wouldn't really compare them. Uh, I would compare their parallels, but yeah. But as far as fun... uh. I would say it was definitely worth playing for me. Okay. Okay. I mean that that's what I wanted to know. I really yeah, yeah, would yeah. like to get into Final Fantasy. I was telling Adam 
before I really want to play the Crystal Chronicles because it's out on Switch. But I just got to wait for it to be on sale. Yeah, on a side note, let me. I, I realize that I uh, did this here. Uh, I, I didn't have my background up. All right, so if you can see my background now, where is it? Let me lean this way. You can see here, this is my, I bought the uh, the first class edition, the collector's edition. Final Fantasy VII is extremely important to me. So I, I have right here my collector's edition cloud model. So. That's cool. <laughs> so yeah, so I mean, I, I definitely am not the person to ask because I have a very clear bias. <laughs> so. Sometimes that's the best person to ask, you know, the people who, who are biased towards it can give you the most information. Well, they, they give you the best sell anyway. <laughs> true, true, true. <laughs> so what about you? What have you been playing? Well, um, I have continued my trend of bouncing around games. Uh, and let me switch back to me. And I played, I streamed this on Monday. It is called uh, Shadowrun Dragonfall. And uh, where is the game? Here, um, in our little viewing box, um, you'll see me. This is my stream from Monday. The quality is not great because it was streamed on Facebook. Facebook only allows you to download the standard definition of your actual video. So uh, bear with me, but uh, Shadowrun Dragonfall, the director's cut. Uh, it was released by a company called Hairbrain Schemes. Uh, you would know them from uh, Shadowrun. Hong Kong. Hello, everybody. This is uh, Crane from Middle Age Gaming. Uh, today I am ago, playing Shadowrun Dragon Full Direct. Direct. That being said, I am uh, as I said in the title, I played this before really and I played really it when it first came out. But um, I only played it for um, about the models themselves. So, so like according I to my scene, my character closely and the stream and he looks so like yep, very that's square, just the way it is. Um, so um, I thought we were gonna give it, it a go. I was trying to think of what I wanted uh, I, I to love play. The way it looks a lot. And uh, there's lots I decided, of dialogue. Well, I'll just give this a go because I wanted something like that. Uh, I started reading the dialogue relatively easy going because there's just so much of text. But in Monday, and, really <coughs> and just bear with me, I'm trying to um, not as stressful as my as Facebook dashboard. I can keep an eye on the chat not too much thinking involved. while you guys are um, There are dialogue really plays in this game, so dialogue really influences uh, the way you, you deal with so the characters, the outcomes of and relationships and events. I can go into um, full screen. Combat was quite difficult. I played the tutorial right, mission on Monday. Stream. I will put notes. In our show notes today, so preview. You can watch Ooh, there we are. Um, uh, hopefully, you guys can hear me in a loud and like clear, and everything is loud. Um, um, if you don't know what Shadowrun is, Shadowrun right, is so a I have tabletop RPG. Really forgotten how to that play was this. created. And I'm like uh, similar to Warhammer 40k. Um, right, it's so a world here. which uh, uh, let me know if this is too small and that kind of stuff. They come back to life. And because I'm uh, playing this, they come back to life. K, I could go down. <laughs> they to come 80. back into society um, again, and the world freaks out. And Shadowrun yeah. is set anyway. Uh, so it says so far so good. If your skirmish is where set up technology alarms, and magic them, sort of Monica leads the rest of the team down uh, into the dragon of Harper 2021. Next year, who knows what So that's that's pretty much the Shadowrun. I definitely say it's someone that's looking for something low stress as. Bigger than it does um, really require schematic. a lot of out of you. Um, you need a to a client think about your decisions. Details. Still, but instructions not a game. The data we're like looking to make the right choice. Just because you can always go back door. and load again. Uh, like Monica I combs the hand through her hair, potting it to reveal the black plastic me. sheath of her jet um, jacket. You also need to I'll have the patience to read all the, the matrix of dialogue, the digital hand waving, and I'll have loud because a lot of this stuff has details about the Burst of static crackles to the tiny speaker on Monica's cup. About their feelings uh, still in position outside the estate. Um, and Hold on, Monica. Who's in charge while we're rejected? At the end of the day, you're looking for something Monica rolled her eyes. Very Dietrich similar to fixes his stay intently on the vault. Uh, difficult, Glory but looks similar. cold and distant. Uh, with Just lots of dialogue. It does have that sort of she always does. Uh, thing Adam and I talked about in a previous Glory. episode where you could be standing in front uh, of someone. We've been through this before, Anka. You're uh, not in the chaos cut at them. And the chair of command you're in front of someone. You should be able to hit them 100% of the time. But you don't need rules and regulations to get us. The same principles So, Adam, what do you think of Shadowrun? Flux estate. So, gameplay wise, this is kind of a SRPG. Or is this more like a Diablo Best style thing? It, it, it's it's very XCOM like, uh, okay. turn based strategy. So, so you first go, choice. enemies go, you go, enemies go. You have a 
abilities, um, you have medikits, I'm wondering if we should change uh, the you have guns, it's and you have like magical, like I see shot somebody and then I threw a bolt of lightning resolution. at the same time. Uh, that sounds complicated. <laughs> um, it, it's, I was worried mode. about the, the complexity of it. Ooh, better. The Ooh, stats, much better. I would better. say, are complex okay. because it's like strength, dexterity, stamina, all the that stuff. That's much like, better. Um, okay. Some okay. casual gamers. Hope you guys like. appreciate that. But oh, that's somebody, not, somebody is watching. Hello, wherever you are. Very much X -complex. So if you uh, I guess that could be me. Combat, you can play. <laughs> all right, so. Okay. Uh, one question. Uh, I'm actually looking at your notes here. Uh, on one note, you say combat is quite difficult, and you almost didn't pass the tutorial. But then later on, you say it's definitely for someone who's looking for low stress. So I mean, wouldn't difficult combat typically lead to a stressful game, or how does that really? How do you see the balance there? Obviously, I can't do that. I mean, in the sense like, if you're playing an FPS, you're playing an RPG, right? I mean, I'm the kind of person who likes order. Go into so let's go with this. You're likely to feel frustrated. All right, Monica because stares at you for a moment, clearly like irritated. Then a little the tinkle appears in her eye again. She smiles after she every turn. And every time the <laughs> Very well, we'll do this one. Like, okay, well, well, I'm Jack and Crean is in charge. Oh yeah, I'm in charge. There's a pause. Then I guess okay, yeah, I, I did the same thing with Valkyria Chronicles right? 4. You're putting the rookie in command? <laughs> Got to A rank I'm everything. The rookie Iker, and All right. Well, yeah, it sounds really interesting. Uh, it, unfortunately, you know it's kind of hard Iker. to see the graphics this here. You would say the graphics hold up pretty well no, for a game from a 2014? Joke, or? I'm telling you, I mean, they, they have Monica's tone is open. Evidently, she has heard the The decisions made, you have your answer. And when you Without another game, word, I guess the image flickers and fades uh, from Monica's nice in sort of the isometric view. Sorry about but, that. I uh, can be inflexible. The, the legacy of a long military career, but she knows what she's doing. Um, and she means almost well. about halfway through the stream. It's a legitimate concern. She hardly that, knows me. Uh, There's a the thin line between concern and insubordination. Closer. You let me know if she crosses. Ah, uh, okay. okay I, I guess it's Let's similar to uh, Divinity in that sense, the where the you're not supposed to be looking at him real close up. Into exactly. Her fingers All right. In the smooth okay. Well, I, I'm a huge fan of SRPG, so I might have to expert. check that one out. Actually, <laughs> I'm sure you know if it's available. Is it a PC only or? That part, I am not sure. Let me switch this to you, and I will have a look. Uh, so I put your first news up on the screen. Okay, so I'm going to start with the news then. All yeah, right, I'll, I'll fill you in. Okay. All right, so uh, I'm going to be talking about two things in the news. One, The second one is going to kind of lead into our, uh, what do you call it, topic for the day. But uh, the first one's going to be happy and everything's going to be wonderful. So uh, some people have done some demining on the new PS5. They've been doing it. Excuse me. Uh, people have had hands-on with the PS5, in fact. So we've had a physical look of what it looks like when somebody's using it, what the load times look like. It's been looking pretty good. Uh, but the data mining, people have found a lot of interesting features that will be allowed in the new PS5. So one of them is going to be wish lists. And this is really great because if you have the PlayStation app on your phone, you can have wish lists there, and I have it. Uh, but if you go into the PlayStation Store through the PS4, or if you did it through the PS3 back in the day, you couldn't have a wish list. You just had to like manually think, okay, these are the games I want, and then look them up in the store. So they're going to be finally adding wish lists to the PS Store on the PS5, which is a really great thing. I don't know if you can see other people's wish lists or not. That I don't know, but you will at least be able to keep track of games that you're interested in. Um, so that's going to be a really huge deal. Another thing that they added is that they're going to be allowing parties up to 100 people. I think the current limit is either 8 or 16. I'm not quite sure. But they're going to have parties up to 100 people. Now, currently, there are no games that support 100 players. Uh, as Creedon was pointing out, uh, Fall Guys can support up to 80. But uh, currently, there are no games that are going to have 100. And almost certainly not a game where you're going to be playing with 100 different friends. So why would we need a party size of 100 people? Uh, well, I'm going to be speculating here, but my guess is that these are not just regular parties because in the PS4, if I want to make a party, I have to create a party and then I have to invite my friends and then, you know, I'm the party leader. And then if I leave, it'll go to somebody else. And if everybody leaves and the party's just done and the next time we have to start a new one. Well, with these 100 people parties, apparently they're adding a feature that you can both name your parties and you can attach an image to it. So what I'm thinking is these are going to be persistent parties, uh, kind of like what you might see on a Discord server where people can kind of pop in and out over time. So I think that this is probably just kind of a way to do 
uh, kind of a clan chat if you're playing an online game or something like that. So I'm thinking they're moving more into this persistent parties versus these uh, one-off parties. Now, they'll probably still have that feature, I would assume. Uh, but yeah, so this is kind of interesting that they're going to be allowing this feature. Uh, the other really, really big news, and this is going to be very, this is going to be insignificant if you live in the States, but they are going to make universally X button is select, circle is cancel. So if you live in the States, you're used to that. X is select, circle is cancel. If you live here in Asia, circle is select, X is cancel. And the reason for that is originally when the PlayStation came out in Japan, they were thinking, oh, circle is like, yes, affirmative. X is no. So the circle would be select and the X would be cancel. Now, when they ported games over to the US, for some reason, that swapped. So X was select and circle was cancel. I don't know why that happened, but that is what happened. And for a long time, it wasn't a huge deal. But now with the international community and a lot of games and, uh, you know, back then we had region locked. So if you bought a game from, say, Australia, but you live in America, you can't play that game in America unless you have your uh, PlayStation modded. Well, now, you know, these cross uh, international borders play is kind of a standard thing. I myself have an American PSN account and a Taiwanese PSN account. Uh, so being able to play my American games on my Taiwanese account is really, really useful because sometimes, like, for example, Persona 5, they have it here, but they only have the Chinese version, not the English version. So I have to buy that on my American account. So being able to play across, obviously, is really good. But then, of course, you run into problems like, oh, all my games, Circle is Select, except this one game. This one, Circle is Cancel. And that can be kind of confusing. So they're going to make this a universal standard. X is Select, Circle is Cancel. Um, so it is kind of a big deal. Uh, they're also changing the share button on the PS4. You have a share button on the DualShock 4. Now on the DualSense 5, they are replacing the share button with a create button. Uh, and what that's going to be doing is now it's going to allow you to create gameplay kit, gameplay clips. Uh, they're also going to allow you to do screenshots. So, you know, you can obviously create content. Uh, it's also going to allow you to share your uh, music albums or playlists. So if you have music, you can share that as well. Or voice notes. So you can just kind of, you know, hit the sh hit the create button, create a voice note for yourself, and then send that on. Uh, it's also going to allow you to send updates. So if you have these great, if you have these big parties, I mean, currently on PS4, they have something called communities. Uh, but when you have these big parties, you're going to be allowed to share updates. So you can send updates or announcement announcements to your party. So if you want to tell all your friends, hey, you know, we're doing a big game night for Fall Guys on Friday, you can put that up there. And then when other people sign in, they can see your announcements. Um, and they are also adding something called a boost mode to the PS4 games that are on PS5. So when you buy a game, it should now have something that on it that says boost mode enabled. And what that means is if you play it on the PS5, it's going to uh, load faster. It's going to have uh, upgrades for possibly textures, that sort of thing. Kind of like what you see on a regular game that you can put on the PS Pro and it runs a little bit better. Well, now certain games, you play them on the PS4. If you play them on the PS5, they're going to run a little bit better. And they also have a mysterious feature called Takedown, but we're not quite sure what that is yet. We've just seen the name of it, and nobody quite knows what it is. It'll be interesting to see what this Takedown feature is in the future. Uh, but yeah, so that, that's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, so before I go into my second news thing, because that does lead into our topic, Korean, would you like to jump in? or? Oh yeah, of course. Um, what do you speculate is the Takedown feature about? I honestly have no idea. It could be anything from uh, maybe removing content online. I mean, because currently, if like if you have a Twitch stream or something like that, you can delete it. But I would have to log into Twitch to do that. So it could be something like, oh, okay, you know, if I accidentally clicked the wrong button and shared a video, I didn't really want to. Because I'm sure most of us have done that. If you've done these recording things where you hit the button, you record something, and you meant to delete it, and you accidentally upload it, and you're like, ah, that's like five seconds of nothing. You know, it's the same thing where if you pull out your phone and you're going to take a picture and then you realize that you took a picture of your feet by accident. 
Um, and you just have to delete that photo. So it could be that, uh, but it could also be something about uh, maybe taking down notes off of somebody else's play. I really don't know. Okay. Um, to me, it sounds aggressive. So I was like, oh, is this takedown? Like, you know, I use this feature and I can like take you down. I don't know. <laughs> it's really because um, a lot of these times these things too are, are you, they use code names. Uh, so it could just be a code name for something. It's really completely up in the air. Uh, so, yeah, I don't really know. Um, not quite connected to this, but I, I, I did have a side question. Uh, I know you talked about this before in another episode. You know, you couldn't pre-order your PS5. Do you have an update for our listeners on that? Uh, so they will be releasing a second batch of pre-orders on PS5. Uh, so you will possibly be able to pre-order them. Now, they do say that they expect to sell 7 million PS5s by April. So, I mean, that's long after launch, but we will be getting quite a few. Um, but the only other thing is, so we talked about how Amazon was coming out and saying that their pre-orders were maybe none of them, not none of them. Some of them would not be arriving on time. Apparently, other distributors have come out and said the same thing. Uh, so apparently what happened was uh, in the retail industry there's kind of a lot of times there's kind of this policy of accept every pre-order sort it out later and it seems like we have that problem now where a lot of these distributors have actually issued more pre-orders than they are allocated units and so there are a lot of distributors now coming out and saying you might not get your ps5 on time that's terrible that is terrible but they are there is supposedly going to be a i think a second wave coming out soon of pre-orders i don't know if we're going to have that in taiwan or not uh but i've seen rumors of that so we'll see yeah okay okay all right you want to move on to your second interesting topic Ah, uh, sure i can do my second topic now okay. so my second topic second topic i keep stumbling over my words today i don't know what's going on uh, my second topic is: Have you heard of Hollow Live? Have you? So you've heard of Hollow Live, correct? I have never. Literally, when I read the show notes for today, I was like, "Oh, Hollow Live." <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, okay. So Hollow Live is uh, this new thing where basically, if you have a streamer like on YouTube or something like that. So for instance, we're streaming right now. You're looking at my actual face. Um, have you heard of something called Animojis on the iPhone? I've heard of them. I don't exactly know what they are. I can sort of guess what they are. Okay, so an animoji is basically you do something into your camera, and the they use mocap to basically have the little animated emoji mimic your facial actions. And Hololive basically does this for streaming, where you're on your webcam. It's looking at, you know, your eyes, your nose, your mouth, using all this facial recognition technology. Kind of like right now, we're using, uh, there's an AI in the system that is editing out our backgrounds and putting in a new background. And if I move left or right, the background, you know, it fills in everything that's not me. So it's kind of the same thing, except it's focusing only on me and not on the background. So basically, I'm puppeteering an animated virtual character. Uh, so I could be, you know, anything. And when I talk, it talks. And if I look this way, it looks that way. Uh, so basically, it's you streaming as a virtual character. And this is becoming very, very popular right now. Uh, it, you know, be among people who are a shy and maybe they don't really want to show their actual face. Um, I've heard of a lot of female streamers are using it just because uh, normally there is that kind of stereotype of, female streamers having to do all their makeup and, you know, wear certain things. So now they can just kind of sit down and they don't have to worry about, you know, how they look because their physical look is not on screen. There's this virtual character representing them. Um, so it makes them feel a lot more comfortable. So that's basically what Hollow Live is, is it's this software that allows you to stream as a virtual character, basically. Um, so anyway, Hololive was created in Japan by a company called Cover. And basically right now it's growing in Japan. It's kind of gaining popularity in, in the West as well. And we've seen some uh, some YouTubers using it in America uh, and in Asia in general, it's becoming very, very popular. 
So there were two streamers in Japan, uh, Kiryu Koko and Akai Hayato. Hayato. I'm sorry, my Japanese uh, romanization reading is not that great. Um, but anyway, these two streamers were streaming and they've been getting a lot of donations. So they wanted to show uh, kind of their audience, hey, you know, this is where our donations come from. So they showed a graphic that basically show, distribu- showed all the different countries that were dis- that were uh, contributing to their streams that were, uh, what's the word? I can't think of it now. Not subscribing, but donating. They were looking at all the people that were donating. And one of the countries listed, and one of the higher countries listed, was Taiwan. So Taiwan was distrib- was doing quite a bit of donations. So this is something that's popular locally here. Now, people in China saw this and said, hey, Taiwan is not a country. It should not be included in your demographics. And so they took offense to the fact that they had listed Taiwan as a country when they were listing where their donations were coming from. So Hololive ended up banning these two accounts. I don't remember exactly for how long, uh, but they, they ended up banning these two accounts for it. And when they went and released their statement in Japan and in English and all that, they basically said that the reason that these two people were banned was because uh, they were releasing internal analytics. So they were showing where these things were coming from. They were saying this is uh, kind of an industry secret or whatever. Uh, So they shouldn't have been revealing that information. However, in their Chinese apology, they came out and said, uh, we have banned them because we adhere to the one China policy. And so therefore, uh, it was offensive to uh, the Chinese people. And so therefore, because of this one China policy, we do not acknowledge Taiwan as a country. So basically, they were giving two different statements, one stating, oh, it's for technical reasons, and one saying because we don't believe Taiwan's a country. And this kind of two-faced apology really hurt them because a lot of people in Japan uh, got really mad about it. And a lot of people in Taiwan and other countries were really mad about it. Um, Okay, so here uh, I have what they officially wrote. They wrote uh, on the English, they said they were uh, confidential YouTube channel analytics information and making statements insensitive to certain nationalities. So they said that what what they said was insensitive by saying Taiwan was a country. However, in the Chinese version, they said we're adhering to the one China principle. so obviously this caused a lot of ruckus and this is actually kind of interesting because only 0.2 percent of their current income comes from china so they actually are getting more money from taiwan than they are currently from china uh but they were still adhering to this policy so clearly they were trying to expand the market in china by doing this now since then they've come out and they've apologized for the confusion and what they've said is in the future they're going to try to follow the laws social norms common wisdom and the stance of its current government uh for universal uh so it is universal universally equitable so basically what they're saying is in the future uh what we're trying to do is we're going to make statements that are appropriate within the certain government and we want to adhere to the local laws so that's basically what they're saying is like, oh, well, this is the law in China. So that's why we followed uh, this line of thinking. But in the future, we'll think about what we're saying and we'll we'll say something that kind of is acceptable everywhere. So <laughs> uh, that's a bit of a scandal. And that's getting into our political topic right now. But before we go into topics as a whole, Korean, would you like to share with us some news? Sure. Or do you have questions? We can take a break from this uh, sensitive topic and talk about s- some geeky stuff. We're going to come right back to it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Definitely going to come right back to that. All right. Switching to me. And we can turn off my gameplay. Uh, my news is about the Xbox Series X and PCs. Um, there will be a link in the show notes. Uh, for those of you who are watching live, if you're listening to the podcast, uh, please click on the link. It is an article from Extreme Tech. Uh, Extreme Tech is a very famous website where they cover tech news, hardware, and all the stuff that I like because I like building computers. And in the picture next to him, you can see a really shiny computer with liquid cooling. Uh, that is my goal. My computer is pretty shiny, but it doesn't have you know, custom liquid cooling. Anyway, that's off topic. <laughs> um, so in this article, they basically say that 
the Xbox Series X and the PS5 uh, crushes the equivalent priced PC console in terms of price. So why this really made me think is because this was something I was thinking about when uh, if you go back all the way to our first or second show, first show, um, I was thinking about buying a PS5 because I was kind of tired of spending money on uh, screens, spending money on graphics cards, which are the currently the most expensive <laughs> parts of your computer. Um, so I have a 4K graphics card, capable graphics card, and a 4K monitor. And together, those cost more than $1,000. Uh, you know, one of the things we talked about in another show was the uh, three series graphics cards released by NVIDIA. Um, starting with the 3070, which is 500, is uh, 4K and better than the 2080 Ti. Um, and so that's why I've decided I'm going to just upgrade my computer. But for new people, uh, this made me think. It's like, okay, if I was a new person and I had a, a six or seven year old laptop, I'm like, okay, do I buy a console? Or do I buy a gaming PC? And this article says for sure, you just buy a console. But the thing that made it me change my mind is that if you have an existing game collection, if you're using Steam Family Sharing, we talked about that in a previous episode as well, uh, and you have a huge collection of games, I would even say if you have more than 100 games in your Steam collection, maybe including your Epic Games free game collection, and you have already have a 4K monitor, then for sure you just buy a 4K graphics card. You don't really need to think about it. If you have a 4K graphics card, then just buy a 4K monitor. But if you literally have a minimal gaming collection, I cannot recommend enough the Xbox Series X or the PS5. Um, Adam told us all the exciting stuff about it. Um, unfortunately, um, it just is. I mean, to get the power you can get from the PS5 or the Xbox Series X at a price point on a PC is just impossible. I mean, to drive things on a 4K monitor, and this is including a 4K monitor. Now, if you're just talking about your 4K TV and playing games from your computer on your 4K TV, that is another story. Um, on a TV, I would definitely suggest you could still build a 4K capable computer, but it would still not be 500 USD. Uh, so even that, yeah. So if you're a new gamer or you're upgrading from a poor PC or a really old console, the Xbox Series X or the PS5 is definitely the thing for you. Uh, Adam and I talked about this before. So Adam, what do you think? Uh, so yeah, uh, I was uh, part of the reason that I was looking into this uh, I actually looked up, and, and part of the reason that the cost is so low is actually because with a PC, you have to buy all the parts individually, but with, like, say, the PS4, 5, and the PS, uh, and the Xbox Series X, Microsoft or, or Sony can just buy these parts in bulk, and so they can actually save a lot of money on that. That's part of the reason why the cost is so low. Um, but it is kind of interesting, because you, you're, you're bringing up the, that you would need a monitor that can support 4K. But I mean, arguably, if you're doing a console, don't you kind of have to factor in the price of a TV that can do 4K? Yes, but I mean, you can get a 4K TV. Uh, I looked this up during this week. Uh, of course, not a massive TV, you know, like a 48 inch or 55 or 65. But you can get a 37 inch 4K TV in Taiwan. Uh, for two hundred and fifty dollars, U.S. Yes, yeah, U.S. dollars. Oh, <laughs> this is like two hundred fifty dollars. Oh my gosh, that's like that's like it's lunch. At two hundred fifty U.S. Um, okay, wow, that's cheap. It, it is. I mean, now it's not a great four K TV, but it is. It is cheap. I mean, the cost of TVs are cheap, but four K monitors, on the other hand, have that extremely low latency between your controller and what you do. Uh, that's why people always say if you want to use a TV as your monitor uh, for your computer, there is some sort of input lag because of the way 4K TVs are constructed. Well, uh, there's also the issue of frame rate, right? Most 4K TVs are not going to have the refresh rate of a monitor, correct? To totally true. But even now, I mean, my 4K monitor uh, using DisplayPort 2 uh, I get maximum 60 frames a second. Now, if you want to go to, uh, they've just recently released 120 megahertz 4K monitors and 240 
you know and if you want to get those kinds of monitors you're paying big money not to mention having a graphics card that can drive more than 100 frames per second uh, for okay. a big 4k tv do you know what a refresh rate on a typical tv is because i don't uh, a typical TV, my TV, my uh, Samsung, I bought this almost two years ago, uh, 55 inches, a pretty decent model. I paid about 600 US. Uh, that does 4K at 30 frames per second. Okay. Because I know, I know the, like, for instance, ours does that AI thing where it does the tweening frames to boost the frame rate. Oh, okay. Of uh, certain... But I, I remember. You well, but that's for, like, TV shows, because certain TV shows, like movies... I think they do do they they do what like 20 24 frames per second or something like that so it just fills in the tweening i don't remember but also uh for pc i mean don't you kind of have to factor in versatility i mean if, if for instance if i'm buying a ps5 i can really only play games on it if you're buying a pc i mean you're not just playing games you uh, you're you're also using this for email and other things i mean isn't doesn't that kind of factor into the cost as well it, it, it definitely does, and, and I agree with you there. I mean, I was looking at strictly from a, a, a gaming perspective, somebody who is, a, a, you know, gamers like us. But then again, you know, being middle-aged, it's unlikely you have a lot of time to play games. So maybe in that case, th that, that sort of pushes the case for the PlayStation or the Xbox Series X because you don't play a lot of games. You play maybe even, like me, play an, a max hour a day and maybe even you when you're busy you don't have any time to play yeah i know um yeah i'm just saying because uh, like as you said we're middle-aged people right and especially now with a lot of this kind of work at home with coronavirus and that sort of thing i mean if i buy a playstation i still need a pc at home right so would you say the cost of a cheap in or relatively cheaper end pc for kind of like email and work from home and that sort of thing plus the cost of the ps4 you know so i have something for gaming and something for work would that still be below say a good gaming pc which i could use for both gaming and work oh for sure i mean if you're buying a, a playstation 4 and uh let's let's take a price point of uh 400 for a computer i mean but 400 for a computer you'd be getting a, a relatively like low end not even medium range computer, mid range computer. You'd be getting a low. But it still do email and that sort of thing, right? Oh yeah, yeah. You, you'd be able to work from it. You'd be able to do some basic PC gaming. Uh, and how much is a PS4 now? Out of uh, it's fifteen thousand and oh well, it's forty nine ninety nine for the PS5. Uh, in Taiwan, it's fifteen thousand. So if you got a PS5 and a low end PC, you'd be capping out about let let's say a, a eight hundred or so. Yeah, eight hundred, yeah. nine hundred. Um, so, I mean, that could be doable, and definitely that would be much cheaper than a uh, sort of mid to high range gaming PC. Okay, yeah, because the graphics card for the, what, the 380 is 799 799 plus you'd pay seven, at least 799 for a monitor. Not including right, that's your just the card is 799 Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, okay. so, like, even my computer, I've spent at least $2,000 on. Uh, and that is mid to high range. You're talking extremely high range. You're talking four or five thousand US at least. Now you also have to factor in though things like uh, PlayStation, uh, PlayStation Plus, or traditionally they have Xbox Gold, right? I mean, like for instance, PlayStation Plus. I'm I'm paying. Uh, I don't remember how much. I, I said it last time. Was it forty five dollars a year, fifty dollars, sixty dollars a year? I don't remember. You know, my memory is as bad yeah, as, as yours. <laughs> but I mean, I'm paying like sixty dollars a year for that. So I mean, over the course of of the six year cycle or whatever, that's like three hundred and sixty dollars added on to my initial investment. Whereas PC gaming is is mostly free online, correct? Uh, totally, totally, totally. Um, PC gaming wise, uh. Did you, did you pay anything? I'm thinking Steam, Epic Store. Uh, no, no, no. You you don't pay anything at all. Okay. Now that now, admittedly though, that might change because like as we see, Xbox Game Pass is coming to PC, and I think they're getting rid of Xbox Live Gold just and just doing Game Pass. So I mean, that's going to be if you're PC or Xbox, you're paying for the same thing. Uh, and obviously now with streaming like Stadia or uh, Amazon Luna. Obviously, those features are all going to be paid for. So, uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how price works in the future. It's it's definitely 
changing from the traditional model of that we have. So, okay, yeah, <laughs> ah, I love talking about this stuff. I never get to talk about it in Taiwan. Oh, it's so sad. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mr. Gray, we should move things along. We are. Yeah, we're a little bit over. Okay, so, uh, Korean, do you want to get started? Or do you want me to start with our topic for today? Um, let me get. Uh, actually, yeah, no. Why don't you get us started? All right. Well, today's topic is political uh, politics, the political prerogative. Do politics belong in games? And uh, I'm just going to ask you a simple question Do you think politics belong in games? Uh, we had this discussion last night, so yes. I am going to 100% agree. I know a lot of people hate politics in their gaming, and they're like, oh, keep politics out of games. And and I definitely and, 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 and feel that way sometimes. But in all honesty, I really think that um, games are art, and politics are very much a part of art. I mean, art is expressing ourselves and what we think and our ideas and if what are politics if not our ideas of what we think how we think things should be um so i'm going to agree with you there i definitely think that politics do have a place in games um probably not every game i don't think you're going to need politics in a game like fall guys uh there's definitely you know should be kind of a safety zone there but um but i definitely do think they do belong uh however as with a lot of times with politics, it can lead to censorship. So I'm going to be covering the censorship aspect of politics and gaming. Uh, so first of all, what is censorship? Well, censorship is when you basically say, I am not going to allow this in the game, or I am not going to uh, allow people to do certain things or see certain things in games. And... The most, a lot of times when we think of censorship, the first thing we possibly think of is free speech. And typically in games, you're not going to see a lot of free speech censorship. You might see some self censorship of certain uh, producers. Maybe they don't want certain, uh, they don't want to alienate certain audiences, so they self censor. Uh, however, we are seeing a lot more censorship recently, particularly due to influence from China. I mean, obviously we saw. The Blitzjung incident with Hearthstone, where he came out and said, Hong Kong, uh, you know, was it uh, revolution of our times and all that. And ended up getting a ban and ended up losing his prize money. Now, after that, I actually ended my WoW account and I sent an email to Blizzard saying that the reason I was doing it is because I did not agree with their policy uh, or their decision, rather. I did not agree with their decision, and so I would be banning myself from the game as long as he was banned in an act of solidarity. Now, I went through the rules after they did this, and actually they had a list of rules, and it says like, oh, you know, for this violation, this is the punishment. For this violation, this is the punishment. And at the very bottom, there was basically one last rule, and it said if the person acts in a way that Blizzard feels reflects badly on them, they can ban a player and take away their prize money. Now, this was the only one where both taking away the prize money and a ban was an option. Most of them was were shorter bans, but they keep the prize money or a reduction to prize money. This is the only one that had a ban and reduction of prize money. So the fact that they went straight to the strictest punishment for me um, just told me like, yeah, this is corrupt. And so that's why I had to do it now. In all honesty, if he had done that and they had given him a ban but let him keep the money, or if they had... Ultimately, what I would have preferred is they gave him a warning and said, hey, you know, we don't want politics on this platform. We want to keep it focused on the game. Here's a warning. Don't do it again. If you do it again, we'll ban you. I, I might have been on Blizzard's side there, uh, but the fact that they just went straight for the most extreme thing, uh, similar to this Hollow Live thing, you know, where they just straight up ban somebody for it, uh, to me, that's just extreme oppression. So, yeah, I, I was definitely against that. Um, we also see it in games like Devotion, which is a red candle game, a game made by uh, Ta a Taiwanese company. And in Devotion, there was the game got great reviews. Even in China, people love this game. And then one day, somebody walked over to a wall, and there's kind of a uh, 
a banner or a poster on the wall. And if you read the poster, it says something the something along the lines of uh, Winnie the Pooh idiot or something like that. And I mean, this is just a background image. This is not an important thing. You know, if you're the kind of person who likes to go through Assassin's Creed and look at all the individual cobblestones on the street, this is that kind of thing where somebody noticed it and they posted it up. And then suddenly the game got review bombed to the point where Steam even took it down. Uh, or I think I don't think Steam took it down. I think Red Candle themselves took it down and said they were going to change the image because it was a placement issue image and they just forgot to replace it with something else later. Um, so something like that or, for instance, an Animal Crossing where people can kind of create their own customized stuff, or, you know, and people were posting free Hong Kong and that sort of thing. So the, the entire game of Animal Crossing got delisted in China. You can still buy uh, secondhand copies on the gray market, but you can't officially buy Animal Crossing in China anymore. So these are examples of free speech, and we're typically seeing them in China. I'm sure you would see them in other countries as well, but I, I think China is probably the biggest country that has a large gamer uh, player base, uh, whereas a lot of these maybe smaller countries are typically poorer countries you know, that are run by dictators and whatnot. So free speech is definitely an issue that we see. Another thing that we see in terms of censorship is symbolism. Uh, so Korean and I were actually talking a little bit about this yesterday and on an unrelated thing. But uh, in the game Wolfenstein, the new Wolfenstein, in Wolfenstein, you play as a character who's fighting Nazis in an, uh, in an alternate universe. And in every version of the game, you're fighting Nazis. Well, in the German version of the game, you're not fighting Nazis. You're fighting this group that has a red flag with this weird triangle symbol on it. And... Their leader looks remarkably like Adolf Hitler without the mustache. So, so he's, so you know, they basically just edited the hairstyle on the guy, and they're like, "Oh, no mustache! You clearly can't recognize him. That's their leader, though." Um, now, and I get it because Germany, obviously, uh, their history is a very sensitive topic, and so, and they've had rules where they've banned, you know, any kind of memorabilia or, or any of, of that kind. So, I, I kind of get it there, but at the same time. There, it, that brings up the question of, you know, those who don't learn from the past are doomed to repeat it, right? So it's one of those things where we should, you know, should we acknowledge the past or should we just, there is a past, but we don't want to see it, you know? So so that that's another form of censorship. And the last form of censorship is probably the most controversial. And that is uh, just kind of local sensitivities and, and things that make people uncomfortable. Uh, so for example, uh, Games like Dead or Alive or Senran Kagura, you know, these games uh, that are notorious for what people like to call jiggle physics. Um, a lot of people don't feel that that's appropriate. And so they want to uh, censor these games. You know, you should desexualize women. Um, now, on the other hand, though, there's always the argument that it's not just sexualizing women. I mean, if you look at the guys in these games, I mean, come on, six packs, ab eight pack abs for crying out loud. I mean, these guys are are jacked. So, I mean, in a way, it kind of sexualizes everybody. But also in the case of Senran Kagura and another game, Omega Labyrinth Zero, the girls in those games are typically very, very young. So in Japan, in Senran Kagura, the characters are, you know, if you look at the characters' ages, it says, you know, 14, 15, 16. If you look at the American version, it says, you know, 18, 20, 22. So basically the game is exactly the same. They just changed the ages of the characters. So you have this 22 year old who's still in high school. Uh, but it's because obviously in America, they have very different views on uh, what is appropriate for that sort of thing. And then of course, also things like violence, for instance, the game, game Manhunt was banned in Australia. Australia is pretty notorious for their censorship rules. Uh, so violent games will not be released there. Uh, and then also actually Fallout 3 was initially banned in Australia as well because of its drug use, uh, which is kind of interesting because in Fallout, you can use the drugs. It'll give you a temporary boost, like maybe your VATS recharges faster or something like that. But your character actually can become addicted to it, at which point each time you use it, uh, the effect lasts for a shorter amount of time. But also, if you don't use it, then your character gets debuffs. So there's uh, there's a level of addiction there as well. Um, 
unfortunately, uh, I mean, but then again, you can just go to a doctor and say, hey, you know, cure me and you're cured. So it does kind of not do that. So really the question is censorship in other forms of art, for instance, books, would we censor those sort of things? Would we say you can't have this in there or you can't have that in there? Um, would we censor those things? And so in games, should we censor those? Should we say, hey, you can't have this. I'm, I'm falling off the camera here. Should we say, uh, so in games, should we say what people can and cannot see? Or should it be like other forms of art where it's just say, hey, this, this form of art is not for me. I don't want to see it, but we should leave it and allow other people to see it. So uh, that was probably a longer description than I really needed. But uh, Korean, yeah. Want to discuss censorship a little bit, or? Sure, sure, sure. I, I mean, you know, we we talked a bit about this yesterday. Um, I know you are uh, against censorship. Hundred percent. And I and I think, <laughs> as bad as this <laughs> is to say, I think certain things need to be censored. Um, I went too far the other way. <laughs> no, no, I, I I repositioned your your your. your oh, <laughs> okay. So you, you should be looking for you're looking at an old image. So right now you, you you're, you're dead fine. You don't need to move. Okay. It. Yeah. Um, I, I I think certain things should be censored. I made the argument to Adam uh, last night after work that uh, we need to certain things need to be forgotten in order for us to move forward. Adam literally just said the opposite thing. You know, a few minutes ago he said you know we have to remember the past. Uh, you know, in order to really understand where we came from. I two perspectives. Yes, yes. Doesn't mean one's right and one's wrong. Exactly, exactly. Uh yes. And your video has decided to <laughs> become weird again. Ah, that's okay. We can move forward. Yep. Um so sorry while we wait. I just have to resize Adam. Multitasking is so hard. <laughs> I'm so bad at it. <laughs> It is. Um, okay. I'd say it's our male brains, but that would be sexist. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So to sum it up for everyone, um, um, what is your summary for your thoughts about politics and gaming? Me? Yes. Uh, well, from a censorship perspective, I am 100% against it. Now, I do understand the need for certain things. Like, okay. So, for instance, in a game like Fall Guys, you do have younger audiences playing it so i would say there are things that you should not include um for instance uh you wouldn't want anything that involves say nudity or things like that now and this is a cultural thing too you go over to like say france or you go to europe and, and they have a very different policy on nudity than say america does for instance australia i think is a little more lenient towards nudity but very against violence America is the complete opposite. Nudity, bad. Violence, awesome, right? <laughs> so I think uh, there is definitely a cultural element there. Um, but I am of the view that any art should be available to those who wish to seek it. Um, and so, like, so I'll give you an example. So, for instance, the Dead or Alive games, like I said, are... Uh, known for their j jiggle physics, right? Okay. Um, bouncing ladies. Uh, now, there are definitely a lot of groups out there who are trying to say, hey, you shouldn't make this game. It's sexist. It's bad. It's, it's not appropriate. Um, from my perspective, I would say don't edit that out because there's people who want that. But... I would say we need, so here's, here's my view. I think the industry shouldn't censor itself. I think it should expand itself to include more audiences because it is very male dominated and that sort of thing right now. Um, and, I'm, and, and a lot of times I think when we get into politics, a lot of times people are saying we need to take this away. And, and I'm against the let's take this away from this group thing. I'm very much let's give this to that group thing. So I, I'm, I would definitely say, like, uh, for example, uh, have you heard of a game, Hayato Boyfriend? Uh, no. Okay. So typically, when we think of dating simulators, you're thinking of uh, 
you know, these games that were really popular in Japan among these kind of nerdy guys where you can date all these different girls and, you know, uh, try to pick the, the best waifu or whatever. And traditionally, this is very male dominated. We're now actually seeing a lot of dating simulators that are catered to women that are designed for women that you can date a bunch of different boys in it. They have ones that are catering to lesbians where they're, you know, you're a woman trying to date other women. Um, Hayato boyfriend is your all the boys are represented by different birds. So you're trying to date like a pigeon or oh, I do know a hawk or something like that. Yeah. So it's just this quirky little thing. So that's kind of my view on it is don't take away games from people. You know, it's still you can still have those traditional kind of dating simulators. And if you don't like that, you don't have to buy that. But I do think the industry should expand and include games for people that you know, don't like that. And they, they want this instead. So I, I'm kind of more of a expand your horizons person, not limit your horizons person, uh, I think is the way I would word it. That's perfect. That is, is a good way. And I have to say, I totally agree with you on this point. I think games definitely have to become more inclusive, regardless of whatever your flavor is, what you like, what you don't like. Games should give you the opportunity to play the games the way you like them to. So you want to go on your topic? Sure. I'm, I'm going to uh, shorten my topic a little bit. Today. Yeah, I went uh, a little over. Sorry. <laughs> uh, no worries. Uh, we are a fair bit over. I think this will definitely be the longest episode we've ever done. Record. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let me remove my news and, and put in my topic. So um, as far as today's topic goes, we were going to talk about politics, right? And politics and gaming. Um, I viewed this topic in the sense of ideologies or political ideologies in games. So if you're a younger listener or someone who's not familiar with politics, generally speaking in the world, there are two kinds of ideologies, generally speaking, uh, liberal and conservative, and there are lots of variations in between. Um, in games I have played, I generally, I'm a liberal person myself, so don't, don't hate me. Um, I generally play liberal leaning games, but I still find, uh, I mean, I've been playing games since I was six years old. I'm turning 38 this year. So in the last 30 years of gaming, of games, uh, games sort of lean, are leaning more and more liberal, which is goes literally back to what Adam just said is he wants games to include more things. But at the same time, I, I would agree with Adam that like certain political philosophy, philosophies or ideologies, you know, liberals tend to, uh, promote, you know, same-sex marriage and uh, LGBTQ things and some stuff. I mean, even in Taiwan, Taiwan is very open, very democratic, uh, but there are still loads of people where we live uh, that are just, I wouldn't say closed-minded, but they're uncomfortable with uh, someone being gay or someone being lesbian. Um, they're uncomfortable with that lifestyle and talking about it and especially in, in doing that in a game. Now, um, if you look at the picture next to me over here, uh, Gone Home, Gone Home was a fantastic game. It is the first story game I've ever played in my life where it's a pure story, not a lot of me mechanics or mechanisms. And it was a game that literally just made me cry uh, in the end of the story. So uh, before I talk about the spoiler, um, Please skip forward a minute if you've never played Gone Home or you intend to play it um, because I will spoil the ending of this game. So in this game, you're a girl, you come back to her house and you're exploring your house, discovering who you are and what happened. And in the end of the game, you figure you find out that, oh, actually you're lesbian and you're in love with this other girl and this caused a whole lot of conflict in your family. Um, and the story and the way it sort of ends in the end is just so wonderful and I told all my friends like hey play this game uh, but like one of my really good friends Hans I mention him sometimes on streams because uh, we will play Trine 4 tonight um, th he he doesn't he's just not comfortable with this kind of game and I'm like for me I feel like regardless of you know whatever you like you know whatever s whatever is your sexuality uh, pardon my English um, this is a game that should be played by everyone. Uh, that being said, if you're not comfortable, I understand. Uh, but I, I mean, let me ask you this, Adam. I mean, do you think yes. there should be a different Gone Home version for each person? 
Absolutely not. I mean, for me, I feel like sometimes the purpose of art is to make us uncomfortable. I mean, it is to it is to force us to think outside of our comfort zone and and acknowledge new ideas. I mean, that's a big part of art is challenging our preconceptions. And I think changing that would I mean, OK, so you said that part of it is that she had conflict in her family because of that, right? Mm -hmm. You take that out, it completely changes the whole point of the game. I mean, I myself, one of my sisters is a lesbian. So, I mean, you know, like, I think these people, not 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 these people, I think everybody's story is worth hearing and, and, and we need to relate to people and taking that out and censoring it. I mean, I think you're really kind of hurting yourself more than anybody by by doing that. Um, on a personal note, like for me, one thing, uh, I know like traditionally there's kind of been an overrepresentation of white male protagonists. Um, and so now we're seeing like a lot more people of color and female, uh, protagonists, you know, Aloy and, uh, Horizon Zero Dawn or, uh, Laura Croft, you know, obviously she's been around for a while, but, uh, they very kind of, uh, revamped her and, and whatnot. But this is one thing that I, I, I completely don't agree with a lot of times where people say like, oh, I need, you know, like you see some gamers and they say, oh, I don't want a female protagonist. You know, I can't relate to that. And for me, I think that's just ridiculous because, I mean, for example, like I can watch a movie and I'm a white guy, but the protagonist might be a black man. And OK, maybe I can't relate to him as a black man, but I can relate to him as a co-worker i can relate to him as a brother you know maybe uh if i ever have children i can relate to him as a father there's so many things that i can relate to this character on that the color of his skin is so minor that like you know like there, we definitely have more in common than we have not in common and i think something like this gone home thing like you were saying you didn't even realize that this character was lesbian until the end you were relating to this character on a completely different level. If you get to that point and you're like, oh, she's a lesbian, I can't relate to her anymore. I think that's kind of ridiculous. So I, I do think that they should have games like this that kind of challenge people's perceptions and then give them that kind of twist ending at the end. You know, it's kind of like, oh, wow, you know, I hadn't considered that or thought of it that way. Um, so, no, I wouldn't I would not change it at all. All right. Um, would you like to add anything else, Adam? Uh, no, I, I think that's about it. Um, and, and like I said earlier, where I'm saying, you know, expand horizons. I mean, obviously, for somebody who is uncomfortable with uh, uh, a homosexual protagonist, there are still plenty of games you can play that oh, don't have that. So, I mean, yeah, I, I think games are for everyone. And I think we should really embrace uh, variety because... I think we should still have things that make us comfortable because obviously games are designed for relaxing, right? Uh, so yeah, there is an argument that we should have some games that are just like, eh, this is my comfort zone, I feel great. But as a form of art, I do think games should challenge people uh, at times as well. So, Okay, ladies and gentlemen. And as Adam said, record. We have set a record for the longest episode Yay. ever. Uh, we will try to be more brief in the future because that is the point of our show. We want to give you all this amazing news, gaming, topic stuff in as short a form factor as possible. Uh, thank you for tuning in today so much. It has been an exciting show. Uh, just and to remind to everybody. To be fair, politics is a, a topic that does need to be embellished a little bit longer. So course, other topics might not have to go as long. Of course. Uh, Friday's show will be, um, we're going to prepare at 9.30 a.m. Taipei time. We should be on time for 10 a.m. Friday Taipei time or 10 p.m. Thursday night Eastern Standard Time. So please do tune in and Friday will be our special gaming only show. It is a holiday in Taiwan. It will be October 9th, but the holiday in Taiwan is called 1010. I am excited. I am excited. I'd love to have a show where we just talk about games, games, games. Yes. All right, and thanks for tuning in again, and see you guys on Friday. Catch you soon. Okay.